and welcome back to AR Tales, aka the ART Podcast. I am Mayor Mina Bada, and today we have a special group cast. We haven't done one of these in a while, but man, when I met these two, I knew that I had to get them back together and chat with them both. Rebecca Rossi, YA slash horror author, and Caleb Ortega, historical fiction slash fantasy authors, in the flesh, back again. Heavyweights, honestly, they are both an inspiration. That's why I'm more than excited to get them back on. So without any further ado, how are you two doing? Good. Great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wonderful. Happy to be back. Happy to be back. Yeah, I am more than excited to get right on to it. So without, uh, you know, delaying any further, what is the things that you are currently working on right now? For the people that are unaware, the people that don't, 100% no. Rebecca is the author of The Signs of the Zodiac. Already out, a trilogy about the Zodiac gods and just a huge universal battle. I mean, I just love the concept. Uh, it was such a fun and interesting thing when we talked about in our episode. And if you haven't checked that out, make sure to do so. And she has one book coming out soon. Pre-orders are opening up. The Devil Within Me. It is insane. I am just... And, and everything we talked about, horror... Uh, just the whole corruption of, 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 a, of like a, a white rose and an essence, like just the, the character and like that, how you get to follow it all the way through. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you very much. Yes, it's coming out on Valentine's Day. So pre-orders will be opening up next week. Awesome, awesome. And then CT, I mean the heavyweight, knocking out five ye- books coming out this year alone. Different titles he has, standalones, he has series, so for people that are unaware, and again, if you haven't listened to the episode, go ahead and do so. Not only is it just instructional about the author's path, progress, and what he's currently working on, but really motivational, honestly. Just his work ethic and how he treats the craft. It really is something to, to take notes on, truly. Uh, yeah, so the first is I'm reading through The Devil Within Me, and I, I assisted to get to kind of be an early reader, and, and uh, I, I'm enjoying that one. So uh, I've now read that one twice. It's spectacular. It is a good read for sure. And um, for myself, I'm publishing books three and four of the Warfare of the God series. That's the Odin versus Zeus versus uh, uh, Jove and Jupiter and, and uh, Osiris, Egyptian, all the mixing of mythology. So that's that's pretty exciting having both of those come out this year and then uh sweeping the standalone series so that i have a greek assassin book coming out in march 1st uh a chinese mythology with dragons september october i'm taking my my hack at horror i'm, I'm not i'm nowhere near what rebecca did in this book it's it's uh she has a really special book there uh, but I'm going to do zombies and I, I just always had a love for them. So I'm going to have some fun with that one and their origins, which takes place in Haiti with voodoo and mysticism and all that. Oh, so kind of taking yeah. it, taking it there and having a good time with it. a very different take and understanding of, of them. So I'm excited. And then uh, in December, I have, uh, I'm going to say it's a personal project, but of course I'm going to publish it out there. Uh, I have, a, I have a Jewish ancestry uh with my family so i'm making a david and goliath level type book and uh, it takes place in that era and it poses the question very simply for every david who beats a goliath like he's you know he's historically known we talk about that 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 overcoming the giant to ever from sports to everything uh for every one of david there's probably a thousand people who tried and utterly failed and so my story is about one of those guys who utterly failed in their their goals to accomplish beating the giant and had fun with that one so i'm excited for this year it should be fun god i'm excited for this year just hearing what both is coming uh, both of you have coming out and just ah uh, i don't know there's nothing more that i love in the, this craft and seeing other people that are really passionate and really like uh going after like the things that they want so one thing that I really liked about you kind of going into the whole thing about horror is that it perfectly gives a segue into what I want to talk about first, which is you're both fantasy authors. What are the things currently that are like really moving you and really inspiring you in that genre? Based on what you've read in the past, your, pre- your previous inspirations, what are the things that you are excited to write in the future? What are the things that have excited you to the point to write what you've previously written? 
I think I mentioned on the last episode that I wanted to keep writing horror. Um, that's mm. probably going to be my bread and butter from now on. And I'd like to do a horror novel a year. It's probably feasible because I have a kid as well and I work four days a week, so I can't pump out as many books as Caleb. But um, I'm, I'm hoping to do a story next year. I've got a bit of an idea um, about a girl who had a very close relationship with her grandfather who passed away and he's protective of her in the afterlife, but he's a little bit too protective. So anybody that wrongs her, dead. Uh, it's going to be pretty full on. So that's my next idea. Wow, I love that. And the, the reason I thought it was so interesting is because like um, you and CT are almost like a yin and yang where, well, I can't say yin and yang, but it's kind of like... Um, you compliment one another because you have written your fantasy in the past, but now you're focusing on horror. Yes. And he and CT is his bread and butter is fantasy. And now he's dabbling a little bit into the horror as well, which is why like, I, I kind of like that you both have the, 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 the contrast of it. So with like that love of, uh, of like fantasy blending into the horror, how do you take that into your latest inspiration for the horror book that you're pumping out with CT? Uh, so for myself, and I'll use the zombie book as, a, as an example, I think all fantasy for, I mean, as long as we can remember, it's always been the good guy versus the bad guy. And, and I, I like the idea of taking morality and kind of spinning it and going into the gray zone and challenging people's thoughts. And so I'll give you the very simple premise of the zombie book is it, it's easy, you know, zombies coming your way and he wants to eat your brains. You just take a chainsaw. You get to, you have like five good minutes to pick a weapon and decide what you're going to do. Right. They're so slow. But what if this zombie um, is basically in a drug induced voodooist coma where if they can survive 24 hours, give or take 12 hours, they're going to come back to reality and they're going to be human again. It's a drug induced uh, uh, adventure. So now rather than just pick a weapon and slash them, you have the morality in your brain. Well, it's either him or me, but if I can survive and I can help him to survive, then, then I, I don't want to kill them. I, I want to, I want to figure out how to help them or, and it might uh, essentially expose people's you know, true self that some people really, they, they wouldn't care. They, they, I'm just going to survive and, and do what they do. And so I love that challenging of morality. And uh, I think she, uh, Rebecca does it so well in her book. The way that emotions can be sparked is insane from reading some words on a page, right? How to invoke dread and how to invoke love it's just crazy to think about that. Like you actually have tension in your body rising as you're reading a book, like you're there. And uh, she does it well. And, and I just love the idea of trying to get that feeling of terror or dread as somebody's flipping through my book. Uh, so I, I want to take that attempt. I think it's a, I think it's one of the more incredible emotions you can invoke in somebody reading a book. So I'm excited. Now, I really, really like how you said that. The whole idea of, of evoking emotion, especially if it's powerful enough to really linger with you, right? Now, taking that, those ideas, those like notes, how do you think it's done well? And how do you think maybe even using your own writing where it can be done better? I would say the key is, and I've learned this, I learned this for myself very early, is as writers, especially younger writers, we tend to write, he saw. Oh, you might mute again used his eyes, his eyes as writers all the time. Uh, we don't invoke the other five. Nope. Technical, technical difficulties here, folks. One second. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we don't invoke the other senses. Golly nope. gook. Okay. Uh, hopefully I, need to, we'll I need to have a soundboard with some like elevated music when that ha when that happens. Believe me, and don't get it happens a lot more than you would. Zoom is, is funky. Internet connections are even worse. <laughs> Settings. I apologize. But uh, so essentially, I don't think we do as younger writers. We could do better in using the other senses. What is what is the? You can write that his hand was trembling but it's different when you're invoking how the, the stomach is twisting. And so I, I think taking your time and really kind of sharing those, those quick moments before they turn the corner is better than just he turned the corner and he saw a zombie. 
you know? So what, what is he going through? What is he feeling? Put the reader there and use all five senses. I think is the key. Man, I like that a lot. Just cause like, um, immediately, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'll have to talk to a therapist about it, but immediately when I hear those things, I always try to compare it to my writing. It's like, Oh, I wonder where I can better suit that way. Like, where can I take that tip and kind of evoke it in my writing? And I felt that, while I might use the senses, because I do like the idea of like, you know, the whole smell, the hearing, you know, it adds a lot in order to like, for a, an emotion to really be like linger in a story and for you to actually be in the place of the character. But sometimes I think I'll, I'll maybe zoom in or just like get so focused on a scene, like an idea that I really like, and then kind of like mosey on to the action steps that, of, of the next thing that I want. You know what I mean? So like, I, I, let's say the character's like in a desert and he's dying, I'll give you all the senses, but then maybe like when he's going on, as he's going past, in a short story that I like, that I was like uh, reading, I copied a couple days ago. I just realized that little tension that like I might do it, but I wasn't consistent about it. Have you ever like noticed that in your writing, or have you ever felt a way to maybe combat that? Uh, Rebecca, you want to take that one? I'm sorry, I, was, I thought you were answering the question. Oh, <laughs> oh no, it's the it's the like it's the either 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 you can answer both can answer. It's for both of you. I think it's just. Uh, I do. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say it's just it's it's different in fantasy and it's different in horror because in horror you're really trying to create that dread and that tension, as Caleb said. Whereas in fantasy, your focus isn't so much on evoking feeling, unless it's more of a like a sadness or a happiness. But it's not such an adrenaline rush. So yes, it's, it's a different experience depending on the genre that you're writing. Yeah, yeah, and and, and to add to what she's what she's saying is. It's so interesting because with fantasy, you you almost know you're going to present the happy ending at the end. Um, no matter how you do it, it, it could be a little bit more open. But with with horror, the person is going into it knowing uh, they're expecting to be scared, which it's it's even more of a challenge doing that. And then you have to add to it your main character more than likely is going to survive. And the reader knows this. So how do you invoke fear when they know in the back of their mind, okay, at least this individual is going to make it. Um, I, I think some very good writers have done it where the main character doesn't make it. And, and they've done these twists and they've done, you know, spectacular things with it to play with those ideas and not maybe throw it in the reader's face, but do it in a respectful way. Uh, I think that that's where a horror specifically is more of a challenge because it's almost um, a game you're playing with your reader saying, I'm going to use these words. And although you think you know what's going to happen, I'm still going to give you those same feelings. Because in a fantasy, you, you, you might have romance, you might not. You're not promising anything. Yeah. With, the, with the horror, you are. You're making a promise to that, that you're going to get something out of this very specific. And so I, I think it's an incredible challenge as a writer to do. And, and I know for her book, The Devil Within, as I, within me, as I read it, um, specifically the second time, because I read it first, I was assisting in editing. And the second time I read it, just as a fan, uh, it, it was good. It was the, 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 the third quarter of the book on, you're just like, okay. Oh, okay. And it takes it each step is that little dread goes farther and farther. And so it, she did a really good job doing exactly what we're talking about. Thank you. <laughs> My God. Now, one thing that I really liked about that, I, that about what you said, and it's it a great segue to what I want to talk about next, is expectations. There was something I talked about with a romance author many moons ago, and it was the whole expectation of romance, where and it was a question that was generally posed by, by the author where she said, like, when it comes to romance, what do you expect? When you pick up an author, when you pick up a romance book, you want, do you want things to, ha uh, to end in a fantastical way that, uh, you know, they had their little spat, but then they end beautiful marriage, white doves fly out the end and then, then the end C Cinderella telling, or do you want to be a little more realistic where maybe they, you know, they do break up and they stay broken up, but maybe they respect one another or, or just a, maybe some other third thing where like the, the person dies. I don't know. There's millions of other movies and books of examples, but that's the main thing when it comes to romance, where's the expectation? Do you want the realistic or the fake ending? When it comes to horror, there is no such thing as the expectation. I've seen horror movies and exactly how you said that that main character dies in the most bloodful, horrible way. There's that movie Midsummer where it's actually where they, the character actually kind of grows as a person by the end of the movie. It's actually kind of spiritual. 
to the point that you almost have to ask yourself, wait, did I actually watch a horror movie? I mean, it was more of a spiritual movie at that point. And then you have other ones where somewhere in the middle, a possession story, X, Y, Z. And I just love the expectations. So if you take it to those extremes where it's like romance, it's almost like you almost want that happy ending always. And you have that horror where there's no middle. How do you treat it for other genres? What are your expectations for a fantasy movie, for a historical fiction? Or maybe like, what are your the expectations for the horror that you want to write? How do you treat expectations? I think with horror, it's a little, it was a little bit of pressure because um, most of the horror novels I've read and most of the horror movies I've watched, the endings are never happy. Um, you, it's usually like a fake out where you think, oh, okay, the storm is cleared, everything's great. And then you know, the ghost reappears and stuff. Mm-hmm. So with my book, I thought, well, what do I do? Do I just kill everybody off or do I give them somewhat you know, of a good feeling towards the end and not to spoil anything, but my book generally has a pretty good ending, but I kind of felt the pressure, like I needed to give more, um, more dread, more hopelessness. So I don't know. It really just depends, doesn't it? You know, with fantasy, I definitely want to give them a sense of adventure. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I just know for myself in regard to it, I, I don't, with all due respect, I never want to think about the reader. I mean, when you're writing a horror, you know what you're writing and you know what you're going to present. But I think one of the the biggest fails is sometimes we can overthink it. And you should know your characters more than your readers and just let the story flow. If at the end, the the hero has to die to save the day, then it is what it is. Is You're just going to have to hope that the reader values what you're doing because th- I think the worst thing that we could do is a writer let's say I'm trying to create a horror book is to then say oh, I'm, I'm going to twist this for the reader mm-hmm. and I'm going to subvert their expectations and I'm going to just get the reader it, it, it's it can come across as disrespectful because essentially you're you're controlling the story rather than just letting it flow and, and yeah. so let it go. Let the reader decide if they liked it or not. And, and just like you said with romance, I think it's so simple. Romance, I think, is one of the more easier ones uh, to, to write because the person goes in all that you're going to give them the bubbly feeling. Now, at the end, mm-hmm. you might tear out their heart. You might do whatever you want to do. But as long as you give them that that one bubbly feeling that they can say, I had a, a, a girlfriend, a fictional girlfriend or a fictional boyfriend for five minutes, you're good. You really are. Uh, where, where horror is a little bit stronger because to invoke fear is different. Uh, to invoke happiness is, is, is a, I think, a little bit easier. So uh, I, I really think you just have to be respectful more towards the character than the reader. And this is where I, I really like where the, the book world is going because we are slowly but surely kind of blending certain things, the historical fiction with horror, the, the romance with horror, and, and we can start mixing and matching, which I think can kind of create like all new genres. And it, 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 I think we're opening doors to be really exploratory and have some really good times and some really good stories coming from, from future authors, yeah. Man, we are at like a mind meld right now. You're perfectly segueing to the things that I wanna talk about. Well, I think the whole Amazon and the ability to self-publish to the level that it is, it's almost kind of like when the 3D printer was invented, where literally like new shapes and things that we could never think of designing before were able to be designed. Right now, there is no person standing over you saying like, oh, wait, no, you actually need a a little bit more of a romantic lead. Oh, does that character have to, there's nobody overarching you. There's no publisher stopping you from writing whatever you want to write. So just as you said, all these genres can just blend and just as writers help one another and take notes from one another. We just grow as a craft and craft itself just is, you know, it, it goes, it's better. We get challenged more as authors and the readers get more and more interesting subject matter in order to read. It's awesome. Now, it, and it, the, what I want to ask you is how then do you transfer those knowledges? As you, as we've been talking about genres take a massive difference on how you write, right? So it's something you have to study a little bit in order to like, uh, to like master the craft. So in Rebecca's example, how did you take your lessons that you learned in fantasy and transfer it into your, into your horror? Are there fantastical elements within your horror writing and vice versa? Did you take what you've learned as, as with getting this horror idea out? Are you now going to transfer those ideas into your historical fictions, into your fantasies in the future? 
Yeah, absolutely. I love writing anything fantastical or paranormal. Um, it's very rare that you'll find that I'll write a book that doesn't have some sort of fantastical element to it. So I took a lot of the fantasy, the love of the fantasy into my horror novel with the cursed objects and the, the demon possessing the soul. And the Russian the, doll. The Russian doll, the one yeah. that you showed me that one last time. Yeah. And, um, and also, just like I've said before, that I'm just a big character writer. So I really wanted to make characters shine, especially the one that isn't the main character. I want people to love the side characters just as much. And I got that from both fantasy and the horror novel as well, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then for myself, I think one of the main focal points that they do very well in fantasy world is the understanding that like the character is the most important aspect. And if you take that into the fantasy, or I'm sorry, into the horror genre, uh, I, I think that's probably one of the most important things. Because if you don't care about the character, then it doesn't really matter like what the monster is, the d- demonic spirit, the whatever's going on, you're just kind of being generically entertained. But if you care about that character and you care about you know their well-being, then even if you know maybe in the back of your mind that the person's going to survive, it's still there because you care for them. And, and that, that I think is the most important thing that I've moved. It's not just about the cheap thrill or the cheap you know jump scare, which those movies are great too, don't get me wrong, when they have no character development and it's all about the jump scare. But um, the idea that you really do care about the character and that tension and the, the detail is there so that when they do turn the corner and whatever is in front of them, uh, you're there with them. And so it's, I, I think it helped me to learn that more important than the, the detail of the, the horror is the detail of the character to make sure uh, we as the reader love them. Now, one thing that like, I, I love that you're both kind of like lamenting on is the whole idea of character driven fantasy which is i think like such an interesting concept because the, and then that means that the entire focus is on how the person is dealing with this fantastical element as opposed to like focusing so heavily on the lore of that fantastical element itself now that i think is so interesting because i think that is really what really drives a person into like really putting themselves into the shoes of a character you know, if I write about like the mythical lore of some Egyptian cursed element or whatever, that's awesome and great. And that's a great story in itself, too. But I think there's something to be said about when, when you can like talk about how like the feeling of like being around that cursed object, they just like it just brought a feeling of dread, it put like, you know, the taste of like pennies in your mouth and just like that, that feeling of eeriness, something bad is going to happen. I think there's something it's almost like the literary version of smoke rising you know what i mean it's like it's like oh my god what is going to happen in these next couple of pages so taking all these things that we've talked about how do you think you're gonna continue on with the next series that you that you want to be writing like do you think that you're gonna in rebecca's example for the horror book that you have do you think you're gonna make it a a trilogy or will you ever make a trilogy in a horror uh in a fantastical horror element in the future and vice versa what do you think do you have do you think you're going to be landing more on serializations or standalones caleb because just right now just as far as the, the boom goes of where the industry people are loving the serializations those are like what, what are just like going gangbusters but i but i personally have always been a, a cool uh, a fan of um of a quick standalone. It's like a quick hour and a half movie. What happened to those? You watch a movie, turn it on, knock it out. I love a good standalone. So, and it kind of goes hand in hand with what you were saying before. It's kind of like, do you want to write the stuff that you want to write or do you want to meet the demand of your readers? Right. Um, well, for me personally, I'm really loving the horror standalones, especially the horror novellas. I feel like, I always said that I feel like horror works best in the short story form um, and not so much in the, unless you King, you can write like over a thousand pages, but I love the short, quick novellas that just grab you, and um, they're very, very popular in the horror community on Bookstagram. That they're all the rage at the moment. So I think that I'd like to keep doing that, maybe between 100 to 200 pages. It's also very doable for me, um, given my my life situation. Um, in terms of the devil within me, I don't really see myself continuing that story. It's, it does kind of wrap up quite nicely at the end. Um, but I do want to keep focusing on, you know, like I said in the last episode, more representation, 
gay relationships and horror, trans, non-binary characters, you know, um, just keep giving diversity as well and probably keeping it to the novella format. Mm -hmm. And then for myself, uh, I've always had the idea of like a good Thanksgiving dinner. So my my main dish, the big turkey, is my five book Warfare of the Gods series. If you want to go in depth, I mean, every character is detailed, every world is detailed, and I've had several readers just, okay, this is a little bit too expansive for me. That, And that's no problem. Not everybody wants only turkey on your plate. So uh, that's where I have the, the several standalones. And these are shorter books, quick ends. Uh, I do open them and they all are interconnected, but at the same time, they're just side dishes to the turkey. And and the goal would be, I, I really liked Rebecca's length of her book as far as horror goes. I, I can't agree more. And it, it's something that I would tell you I never even thought about uh, is that the length is, it's about, I'd say maybe a two hour read. And it's a perfect length. You By the time you finish, you have the, the beginning, the end, and the conclusion. And it's not something that you're going to close up and then, okay, I'll finish this tomorrow. You know, have these lingering thoughts. You get to just really knock it out if you chose to in a good night. And so uh, actually her, her book length got me thinking to do a, a few of those. So then my goal would be to present the reader with a little bit of everything. You're going to have, you know, two hour reads, four hour reads. And then if you want to go big, there's the, the five and, you know, book series. Uh, but again, as far as it goes, I'm not the type of re- uh, writer that ponders what the reader is looking for. And I, I don't really believe that Rebecca is either I think she had a story in her mind it fit this length and she goes with it and and I feel the same way I think the best writers are the people who tend to put themselves in the character and just share their story and and not so much you know try to to placate anybody or I think it can end up being disrespectful when you try to even do that so just write your story get your story out no matter what the length and and do your thing so uh yeah she's inspired me with the shorter uh, novellas Hell yeah. Well, then I have to ask, since you both have a serialization and a standalone under your belt now, which one do you have, did, did you enjoy writing more? Now, I know Rebecca might be a little more biased because she really found her home in horror. <laughs> so I guess it's kind of hard there. But as, just, as far as like writing length and the process goes, which one did you enjoy more? Do you like having your brain just like run a million miles per hour for like ever? It's like how writing a, a serialization works where you have to have inter connecting everything or do you like kind of like keeping it condensed into one story i definitely preferred writing the horror (laughs) but it's also because when i wrote my fantasy trilogy i was quite young and my writing was nowhere near where it is now so i just felt more confident this time around and i just had such a great experience trying to scare people and pushing myself out of my comfort zone. It was just a completely different experience to the fantasy trilogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for myself, I would say, as far as beginning goes, uh, I would love the standalones. I just like the idea of taking two to three key characters, two to three basic concepts of, of whatever you choose to, putting it into a story. Now, honestly, once the story is done, uh, I prefer the series. I mean, once you get past all the writing and the headaches of getting it all out, wait, where's this character and all that, and it's printed and people are reading it. Um, you know, I've had I've had conversations with 10-year-olds. I've had phone conversations from people in prison and, and they're just, oh, this this character really hits. And I think that the, the love and the passion for those who enjoy your series is very motivating. So it's just, it's just a different type of fan base, uh, a different type of reader who's willing to just really commit to it. So once it's done, I will say I prefer the series. As far as writing it goes, oh, it's a headache. I'll take I'll take a standalone any day. Yeah. Oh my God. I, that's what, it's funny because uh, I personally, I'm a huge fan of short stories. I know it's one of those things that like, uh, you know, there's like a, a couple anthologies are getting, are getting traction, but for like the most part, I feel like it's almost like dying. I love short stories. I, I love cranking out a quick like 1500, 2000 thing. And it's just like condensed right there. Story's done. You read it in like half hour to 40 minutes. I love that. Like I said, it's just like watching a quick, like a uh, quick little short film on like Disney or whatever. It's, it's awesome. I love that. Now, what I want to end the podcast on is what are the tropes in fantasy and horror that you're tired 
of seeing. Now, I, I tired is, is a little like is a little biased just because if a person writes it in like a, in a unique way, there's nothing to get tired of. You can rewrite it anything in, a, in any way. But do you think there's anything that's been overused? Do you think there, there's any aspects that should just that you just want to see something different? Not even that they should be different, but you just want to see a little deviation, a, a left instead of a right this time. Um, I think that the chosen one trope is a little bit overdone. Mm. Something that I like about Caleb's series is that um, in his first book, I thought that the main character was like the chosen one, but then the second book focused on a completely different character. And then the third one was a different character. And so I like that he shared that among everybody else. Whereas, you know, we've seen, we've kind of seen it done, you know, we've seen Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, like there is always a chosen one. I don't know. Maybe it can be done and refreshed, but I've seen it a lot and, and I'm, I am a little bit tired of it. <laughs> I so agree. Yeah, honestly. It's one of the things that I love, uh, even when we talked about last uh, last episode about the, the story you have about the Goliath. I love that. I think it's, it's exactly what you said. Everyone, you know, wants to be David, but like in actuality, there's a, a thousand people that have no, so have no song, song sung about them <laughs> that just tried and gave it their best shot. It's not like they you know, gave anything less of themselves, they just they did it. And I, I think that's that's a beautiful concept to explore. Right. Yeah. And, and for me, it's not so much I could deal with the Harry Potters of the world. I really can. I have no problem with it. It's what comes afterward when beautifully talented writers think to themselves, I I just want that level of success. I think there's a difference between writing for the love of writing and writing for success. So then all of a sudden instead of you know, Harry Potter did well. Now you have the Wizards Academy, the, the Magicians Academy, followed by the, you know, the, whatever. It's just so many different academies. The Werewolf Vampire Academy. Academy. The, yeah. The Vampire Academy. And, and all they essentially did was let's just take the same story premise and saturate it. And that to me is my biggest thing. You know, Glittery Vampire worked one time in, in all of history. And then all of a sudden, you know, the next 10 years, we have uh, vampire romance love stories. And, and, uh, I, I think that that's where you're taking talented people and just uh, what a waste. You can create your own story. And even if it's, you know, not as big as as glittery vampires in Harry Potter, it's fine because it's your story. And and so saturating the market with the exact same thing to me is my my nightmare. It's my like, oh, my gosh, because there's so much talent out there writing incredible stories and we're stuck reading this exact same one that's on the bookshelf because that one sold. That's what, you know, that's what the market's branded for now all of a sudden. For the next two years, we're all stuck. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I love that. I call those uh, boardroom stories where it's like, right. oh, it's almost like, you know, people were like sitting around. It's like, all right, all right, what can we do? Harry Potter? What, what can we do? <laughs> Harry Potter and a Twilight. Vampire Academy, go. Somebody, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just like, knock, and they just knock it out. I really love that. That is kind of like just... Well, everything that you've been saying, it's like, you know, don't worry about the audience or the reader. It's just like, write your story and you'll find your audience. I think the best advice that my editor gave me was write for your niche and then everything else will go. Just like write for your pack, your people. If it's only five people in that pack, whatever, uh, you'll have five people that are loyal and then like that'll grow from there. Right. Yeah, and yeah. write what you want to read. I, I'm a big advocate of writing what you would want to read yourself. Mm -hmm. Then so again, you'll, you'll the passion. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and again, it's all about the passion, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, I read this thing that was really interesting. And, and basically what it was saying is, let's say a thousand years from now, uh, there's going to be no more stars, no more Hollywood level stars. You know, Tom Cruise, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, they had Rambo Commando and like, you know, everybody had their exact version of a movie, right? The, the premise was now, thanks to social media, you have people in the middle of Indiana who has, you know, 10,000 followers, 100,000 followers, you know, some dude in Alabama because he's legitimately funny or she's legitimately, you know, just has an interesting soul and, you know, people flock to her. And so we're not going to be mirroring each other anymore individuality is going to be a good thing. And so I think slowly but surely the Harry Potter uh, knockoffs, I think companies are going to start getting it. And like you were saying with the saturation of indie authors just throwing out their stuff, it's going to take these superstars and decline them. And it's going to bring up normal authors. And, and I think readers are, are ready for that. Like 
we've heard that, like she was saying, that the chosen one, we've heard this. How about the chosen two or, or whatever, you know, maybe the chosen one has split personalities, like let's do this. Oh. And uh, so I think, I think readers are, are ready for new things. My and God, so, they, yeah, they definitely are. I'm telling you, these talks now just get me excited for the work that the other person had, that other people have, but generally just like how this market will grow. I mean, my God, like the, this conversation 10 years ago would have been blasphemous. And now we're here. I can only imagine what's going to come in the next five, 10 years, heck, even two years with how fast everything is going. But this is the end of the podcast. Another great episode. Again, Rebecca Rossi, C.T. Ortega. All their links are going to be at the bottom. Amazon, go ahead, get everything that they have to offer. It is well worth it. Signs of the Zodiac trilogy out now pre-orders of the horror novella coming soon and it is out on on valentine's day that is uh on a monday this year right i believe right yeah exactly on the 14th get it and ct has books on books on books on books coming out that could just be his hashtag for books on books on books on books (laughs) that's what he's got standalones he has everything coming out for more on either of them, watch their individual episodes. But this is the end of the podcast, AR's Tales. We will be back with you next week. Peace out. Peace out.